everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Sufi Dizal, and I am the Executive Director of the Bernstein Institute for Human Rights. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening uh, for a program that we hope will be thoughtful, engaging, and respectful. Um, tonight, each of us in this room have an opportunity to exercise leadership, to model a way forward on how to exchange diverse ideas and opinions with respect and dignity, and to move the conversation beyond the mainstream headlines. We will discuss key areas of concerns and grassroots demands, shine light on untold stories, and create a space of collective learning and open inquiry, principles that are at the heart of the Bernstein Institute for Human Rights here at NYU Law School. Our institute is committed to the advancement of human rights through cutting edge research, education, and advocacy, with a focus on defending dissent and promoting legal empowerment. The Bernstein Institute honors the incredible legacy of Bob Bernstein, who was a fearless leader and a tireless defender of fundamental freedoms and human rights around the world. The Institute was established in his honor and really strives to honor his courageous legacy, his extraordinary vision, and his deep respect for human rights. Tonight's event is part of a year-long initiative to honor Bob and to commemorate his contributions to the human rights field. Throughout the year, we will host events on issues that he championed throughout his life, free expression, dissent, and the importance of investing in the next generation of human rights leaders. We are fortunate to have members of the Bernstein family here with us today. And um, very shortly, I will call Bill Bernstein, one of Bob's sons and an Institute Advisory Board member, to offer a few remarks. Before I do that, though, I'd like to run uh, through housekeeping and set ground rules for this evening. The panel is structured in two parts, two equal parts. We will have 45 minutes of presentations by our speakers followed by 45 minutes of question and answer. We encourage attendees with diverse perspectives to raise questions and comments. And to maximize participation, we ask that you limit your questions to one minute. Um, and I will take questions at three, three at a time. Tonight's program is hosted by the Bernstein Institute and is not co-organized by the law school. The individuals who are offering viewpoints at this event are speaking for themselves and not the law school as an institution. It also bears noting that the free exchange of ideas and open inquiry are bedrock principles at NYU. And while the university remains committed to an inclusive learning environment, it is a matter of policy that invited speakers will be able to deliver their remarks without substantial interference. The principles of free speech and inquiry are complemented by the principles of debate, challenge, and protest. While dissent may be vigorous, it must not substantially interfere with a speaker's ability to communicate, regardless of content, with an audience's ability to hear and see the speaker, or with the university's ability to fulfill its educational duties and obligations. If substantial interference occurs, which we hope it does not, we will ask the individual to halt the disruption, and if the disruption persists, we will ask the individual to leave. Our hope is that tonight's program is one of constructive dialogue. We really believe that what we can build here tonight is a way to show the world how, how to build constructively, how to exchange ideas with respect and civility. And so we are excited um, to begin. So now please welcome me and enjoy uh, welcoming Bill Bernstein. <coughs> Bill is one of Bob's sons and serves as the chairperson of the board of the firm Manat Phelps and Phillips and the leader of Manat Health Bill's practice concentrates on providing strategic business and legal advice to clients in the healthcare industry. Bill also serves as the chairperson for the Center for Democracy and Technology, chairman of Human Rights in China, and as a board member for the eHealth Initiative. He received his BA and MA from Brown University and is a proud alum, a JD from NYU School of Law, where he served as a Ruth Tilton Scholar and Arthur Gayfield, Garfield Hayes Civil Liberties Fellow. Bill. Good evening, I'm delighted to be here. So uh, first, on behalf of my family, uh, many of whom are here tonight, uh, I want to thank NYU.
NYU team, particularly Trevor Morrison, who's dean of uh, law school, Su Suti Dilchow, and uh, Meg Satter Satterwave, all of who have done just an outstanding job making the Bernstein Institute what it is today, such a dynamic and uh, uh, effective leader in the field of human rights. This event truly does honor our dad's uh, legacy in ways that he would be very proud. Uh, it, it does a few things. It, the, the event and the institute are committed to uncovering and examining facts, uh, to an on-the-ground understanding of social and political events, to teaching the skills associated with, with international advocacy, and most importantly, to recognizing the essential role of individual human rights activists in advancing democratic values and institutions. I want to say a special word about one of the speakers tonight. Sharon Ham, who has served as executive director of HRIC for close to 20 years. Simply put, Sharon is a force of nature. And there's no one in the human rights community for whom my dad had more respect. For the last several years, I've had the honor of serving as chair of the board of HRIC. In this role, I've had a ringside seat on what it takes to hold a world power like China accountable in international forums and to support in-country democracy advocates as they struggle to advance civil society and institutions. Finally, let me make one comment about the subject of today's forum. Our family first became involved with China in 1976 when we traveled with my father and mother there as guests of the Chinese government. It was a strange time because Mao was uh, still alive. He would die uh, uh, in, in September 1976, and everyone seemed to be on edge, waiting to see what would happen. As we all know, much has happened since then. The democracy wall movement, Tiananmen Square, the imprisonment and exile of many Chinese dissidents, as well as China's emergence as a major economic and political power. As I think back on the last 20 years, with all that has happened, it feels at, it feels at this very moment in Hong Kong, we are at a tipping point, watching a struggle that has had, will have enormous impact, not only on the Chinese people, but on the world order for many years to come. So I'm particularly grateful to hear tonight from those on the front lines and get their insights as to where things stand today and the alternative futures for which we all need to be prepared. Thank you, Bill, and you undoubtedly make Bob proud. So thank you for your inspiring words and for your generous support of the Institute. We are grateful. I am now honored to introduce our speakers to the stage. They are human rights activists and lawyers deeply involved in the crisis unfolding in Hong Kong. Tonight, we'll hear their reflections on what brought us to this current moment, discuss the diverse strategies and individuals engaged in this core <coughs> movement, and explore the role of international advocacy, both its challenges, its limits, and its opportunities. Our speakers will offer independent insights revealing the complexity and the nuance of what's at stake. Please welcome me um, in introducing Nathan Law, Jeffrey No, and Sharon Holm to the stage. Chairman of the Representative Council of the Lingnan University Students Union, an 
and Secretary General of the Hong Kong Federation of Students. He was one of the student leaders during the 79-day Umbrella Movement in 2014, in founding and former chairman of Demosistos, a political party derived from the 2014 protests. Nathan was elected to serve as a legislator for Hong Kong, making him the youngest lawmaker in the history of the Legislative Council of Hong Kong. Nathan, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Nathan. Um, thank, uh, first of all, um, of course, uh, thank you for all of you turning out to, um, to attend the event and also the invitation from Bernstein Institute. That, um, I'm very honored to be speaking here, and this is not uh, the well. In, in the, these two weeks, this is already the uh, fourth event that I've attended. Uh, I've had a talk uh, also in Harvard and in Yale, and those are a really good experience of exchange, exchanging ideas uh, between different opinion and conducted in a very civilized manner. And I think in this, this is also a like highly prestigious academic institute that I, I think. The purpose of this event is to increase mutual understanding and, uh, well, increase our um, knowledge about the event and to let the ideas exchange. So I think um, this is a great platform that we could all share. Um, I think a lot of you may have uh, a lot of questions about um, today's Hong Kong and its movement. Um, like most of you, if you have been to Hong Kong in the previous 20 years, it's been always so energetic, um, economically led, and also uh, a, a city that seemingly is not that political. People have been trying to get uh, their livings there and have been, uh, well, re as as uh, issues, uh, well, financial hub and uh, a very strong economic center. But how, why um, Hong Kong now is in such a political turmoil that uh, seemingly there's no solution and five years ago, maybe all of you have seen news about Hong Kong's protest. That was the era of umbrella, umbrella movement. People were so peaceful, and they were demonstrating, and they, there was a sense of hope that they could get something out of it. They could have a political reform that they all treasure, that they all enjoy. But for now, the, the atmosphere of Hong Kong has been so de des desperated, and the sense of helpless and hopeless in all the scenes that we, we witness. And um, compared to five months ago, even, when you saw the scenes of a um, million demonstration on the 9th of June, and also 17th of June, we all see peaceful protesters. But now, why there seem to have an escalation of force that, uh, well, a lot of people are shocked by, by it? These questions, I think, are all lingering in your mind. And I think, um, well, in today's uh, sharing, I'm going to provide some perspective of analyze to help you digest what's happening in Hong Kong. And I think if we are going to go back deep into it, we have to start with Hong Kong's history. And in the 80s, when Hong Kong was um, been through, what well, Hong Kong had been through more than 115 years of colonial ruling by British government, there was a time that the British government and the Chinese government were discussing about the handover of Hong Kong in 1997. But then there were actually a huge uh, confidence crisis in Hong Kong, uh, which Hong Kong people were wondering whether they could keep their way of life after 1997, when they was returned to Chinese ruling, especially a like, socialist communist China, whether they could bridge their um, well uh, capital system, market economy system, and um, in order to solve that um, well trust problem, uh, China and uh, Chinese government and British government in the 80s they have signed it. Uh, the Sino-British Joint British Declaration in 1984 that governs the process of uh, handover and also the ruling after the handover, which they have guaranteed pe Hong Kong people that their way of life can be preser preserved. There will be one country, two system that they separate, two sets of system even in the same Chinese soil. <coughs> the Hong Kong people could still preserve their way of life before, 19, before 1997 and had a different system compared to the one in mainland China. And also, they have guaranteed Hong Kong people several governing principles that made them feel like they have certain confidence about the communist ruling, including autonomy and democracy. So actually, the things that we are fighting for today were the promises made in the 80s, and a lot of 
like international organizations and governments are supporting Hong Kong struggle based on that premises and based on the principle that has been written in Southern British Joint Declaration. So that, um, you know, we've got a huge, uh, well, history or backup on such an international treaty that China ha has the obligation to follow it and to implement it to Hong Kong. And if you see there were uh, three ways of immigration in the 80s and 90s, you could, of course, observe how serious that um, trust problem is, especially after 18, uh, 1989, the Tiananmen Massacre. And after that, um, Hong Kong has been uh, like governed in a framework of one country, two system. And it's always uh, the problem of whether one country can, can balance with two system. One country, two system could only work under the premises that China, they could decentralize the power and let Hong Kong to have a division of power um, to preserve certain autonomy and to preserve um, certain popular ruling instead of centralizing the power into the executive branch. In the first couple of years, um, that system ran well. And we all saw um, after 1997, um, in the first couple of years, people were happy about the arrangement. They didn't protest much. They didn't uh, raise uh, much questions about it because they thought that eventually they could get democracy in 2007 until the year 2003, in which the Hong Kong government was trying to implement the uh, well, Hong Kong version of national security law, uh, which people of Hong Kong back then worried that it will quash their uh, political freedom and freedom of speech. So there was a time Hong Kong people realized that, oh, there, there's something wrong in, in, in the one country, two system. And if China, they do not restrain the exercise of power, they do not have a, a sense of sharing power with the people, then it's not going to work. So after that, um, even though uh, like we've been through honeymoon periods uh, between the two places, especially in the year two, two, 2008, where, when there were uh, Beijing Olympic and uh, Sichuan earthquake that a lot of Hong Kong people donated aroused uh, national pride and national uh, well, identity. That period of time was the golden period between the relationship of Hong Kong and China. It subsequently faded because uh, Hong Kong people uh, realized that their, their rights and their values are not coherent to uh, the Chinese one and, their, and, and, the, and the promises were not given uh, on the basis on, of the uh, Southern British Joint Declaration. And in 2014, we could see such an outbreak that people realize um, they need to fight for democracy with a certain sacrifice. That was the umbrella movement. They occupied the role, they committed civil disobedience. You could see back then it was all peaceful. And there were some crucial differences between uh, the umbrella movement five years ago and today's one. One of them is really vivid it, is that there were no one wearing mask to hide their identity. They still had certain faith in the institution. They still preserved a certain, uh, well, confidence towards the system that they did not um, address people arbitrarily. The prosecution uh, process was legitimate and just, and they still believe that there were certain checks and balances in the system. But five years later, in these five years, we have witnessed a huge encroachment and erosion in our human rights. Uh, well, let me myself as an example. I was elected in 2016, but subsequently being unseated by any reinterpretation from the Beijing government on our constitution, which uh, all of you may know that in, if you are in a civilized and vast region, that the, the role of the power of explaining the constitution shall belong to the Supreme Court or constitutional courts. But in Hong Kong, is the, the, the National People's, uh, uh, well, the Standing Committee of National People Congress, a bunch of people who decide things because of uh, political interest and politi in political intention to explain our constitution in, or in order to apply political pressure. And that was such a contentious topic that like Hong Kong local legal sector were, uh, were protesting about it. And I lost my seat. Uh, and. Uh, people's mandate was overturned. And also I was imprisoned because of my role in the peaceful demonstration. And that was considered one of the like, most uh, serious uh, human rights infringement and political suppression back then. So you could see um, people in Hong Kong in the past five years, they experienced a sense of 
uh, the institution keep failing, keep, keep failing and uh, the institution keep like, losing its checks and balances and the rights of them are being deprived. So five years after uh, the umbrella movement, for now we, we have witnessed an explosion of anger and it's kind of like an accumulation of uh, well, the, the, all the human rights uh, encroachment for the past five years and for now people started to feel like the institution of failed everyone, especially uh, in the way that they can hold the power, ex executive branch, and especially the police force accountable. And we've seen uh, 45 hundreds of protesters are arrested, but none of the police are in any form of investigation, given that there are numerous proof that they have conducted uh, well, ex excessive brutality on the protesters. And well, the one on last Monday who shot uh, two barehanded protesters in their chest, that particular uh, police officer was, was still not in any form of investigation, and the police department has not apologized for any misconduct in the past five months. So you can see uh, this is an obvious evidence of uh, such an uh, institutional failure in holding them accountable. And that is the reason why th the situation for the past five months didn't quiet down, didn't die down. Reversely, it keeps, uh, well, the, well, it keeps fueled by the response of the government and the, uh, well, the use of force and compensation escalated. So I think this is pretty much the basic background to under, in like, understanding what we are facing now and why the situ situation escalated for the past five months. And um, if, well, later on we've got some time, I would like to share my insights uh, in terms of like how we resolve that and in uh, the future of the movement. Great, thank you so much, Nathan. That was very helpful in terms of setting historical context and the underpinnings of the why. Um, I'm now gonna shift to Jeffrey Nome. Jeffrey is a writer, a historian, and a pro-democracy activist based in Washington, D.C., where he is P uh, pursuing a PhD at Georgetown University in history. <coughs> Beyond his academic hat, he serves as the chief researcher for Demisisto, and he is also an alum of NYU. He holds degrees from NYU's College of Arts and Sciences and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Thank you, Jeffrey, for being here. Hi. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks for having me, and it's always good to be back uh, to NYU. Uh, graduated in 2016, uh, then again in 2017. Uh, actually, I've actually never um, been in this room before. And, and, and not that many uh, opportunities to come to the law school, uh, so this is a this is a good time um, to be here. Um, and uh, so uh, Nathan has set out uh, the sort of you know the context in terms of where we are today, and and um, and sort of my contribution to this panel, I hope, uh, is is to talk a bit more uh, about uh, the international front uh, and and how Hong Kong sort of fits into a globalized uh, context uh, today. Um, and uh, our, actually our event today uh, is about the uses and limits of uh, international advocacy. Uh, and, and, and so I'm gonna sort of discuss that in my dual role, sort of my uh, role as a researcher, uh, having uh, understood Hong Kong's history in, in sort of globalized context, uh, and sort of uh, my role uh, as an activist in Washington um, and, and trying to um, do the best I can um, to, to push forward. Uh, legislation and, and also, also in terms of uh, spearheading other efforts to support um, Hong Kong. Um, I mean, so the the, the whole idea uh, of, of one country two systems, which is the um, constitutional framework that that, that, that Hong Kong uh, is supposed to be uh, under, um, for 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 some of you, uh, you may know, um, it was actually uh, designed by Deng Xiaoping uh, in. Uh, the early 1980s, I believe, uh, 1980 or 1981. Um, and initially, it was a framework used for Taiwan, um, and 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 so today I'm actually going to focus a bit on, on Taiwan and, and, and the U.S. Um, and and the idea really uh, was that uh, back back at the, uh, at the time uh, when uh, Taiwan was still uh, ruled under martial law uh, by the KMT, um, the the Chang the Chiang Kai Shek and later his son, the, the Chang family. Uh, actually thought that one day they would uh, sort of return to the mainland and, and so they uh, insisted that they were the legitimate China uh, and obviously the communist regime uh, in, uh, based in Beijing, they also insisted that they were uh, the rightful 
sort of regime uh, governing China. So there was actually no disagreement between the two of them uh, in terms of both belonging to one nation state. Um, they just disagreed in terms of which government had the legitimacy. Uh, and so it was always the goal of the Chinese Communist Party to uh, unify uh, both sides of the strait. Uh, and, and, and one country, two systems uh, was uh, supposed to be the framework for that. Um, but uh, Taiwan did not accept it at the time. Uh, and, 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 and so later on, uh, by the time uh, of 1982, uh, when the Sino-British negotiations began, uh, a different version of a one country, two systems was put forward. Uh, and eventually that was the deal that was agreed by the Chinese and the British governments uh, behind closed doors uh, without participation, meaningful participation um, from Hong Kongers. Um, and, and so as a former colony and as a former colonized subjects, uh, Hong Kong has lost the right of self-determination that was guaranteed uh, by international law under the UN, um, uh, various UN documents. Uh, and this is what we really mean when we talk about self-determination today. Uh, it was that uh, as a colonized people, we lost that chance uh, to decide our future. Uh, and, and we want to be able to have that say uh, when 2047 comes around, which is the year that the 50 year uh, no change uh, policy is set to expire, uh, and which uh, neither the Sino British Joint Declaration of 1984 uh, nor the uh, basic law, which is our constitution, uh, constitutional document of 1990, neither of those documents actually say anything about Hong Kong's post 2047 future. Um, and subsequently, then, in the Sino Portuguese, uh, negotiations over Macau's future, that framework was used again, uh, and, and hence Hong Kong and, and, and Macau uh, are the two um, sort of you know, special uh, administrative regions uh, uh, today uh, in the People's Republic of China. Um, so uh, so we, we, you know, we can sort of understand that you know, Hong Kong's past has, has always been uh, very globalized. Uh, it was, it was uh, colonized uh, in 1841 actually by the British Empire. Uh, it was uh, developed as a free port, uh, you know, where uh, merchants from both China and the West uh, were able to trade. Um, and, and in the 1980s, actually, uh, when the uh, British government and Chinese government concluded that deal uh, that, 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 that governed Hong Kong's post 1997 future, um, in order to ensure that that deal uh, had the legitimacy uh, in the eyes of the international community. Uh, both governments, uh, but actually, especially the, the Chinese government, uh, lobbied very hard for uh, the support of other governments so that they could endorse uh, this treaty. Uh, and this treaty is also um, registered uh, at the United Nations. Um, so actually, uh, the international community uh, you know, does have a stake in Hong Kong, continues to have a stake in Hong Kong, uh, which remains a financial, international financial center, uh, but also in terms of international law, that, that, that they, they have uh, the, the responsibility and the right to hold China accountable um, to something that uh, the Chinese government has agreed to. Um, one of the governments that the, China, the, the Beijing regime actually lobbied very hard uh, to endorse the uh, joint declaration uh, was the uh, US government. Uh, and, and, and so uh, a, a, a piece of legislation uh, was, uh, was signed into law uh, by President George H.W. Bush uh, in 1992, the U.S.-Hong Kong Policy Act, uh, and that is the piece of legislation uh, that has since governed the relationship between um, you know, U.S. and Hong Kong. So, um, so uh, you know, under U.S. law, uh, America also has uh, its obligations uh, uh, to uh, ensure um, that the um, promises uh, uh, that the Chinese government has made uh, is being met, um, and also that you know, there, there should be responses to, uh, to uh, changing circumstances uh, should um, Hong Kong's autonomy be lost. And this is what brings me to 2014, um, five years ago um, when the Umbrella Movement uh, broke out in Hong Kong. Um, as many of you would know um, that that movement uh, w w was, um, uh, you know, broke out because Hong Kong has demanded genuine universal suffrage uh, and for the third time uh, the Beijing government had denied that to the people of Hong Kong. Uh, and at the time, I was actually uh, in Washington. I was, uh, for, for NYU students here, you would know that there's a, a NYU DC uh, campus. I was actually, uh, that was my study away semester there. Uh, and it coincided with uh, the outbreak of the Umbrella Movement. Um, and uh, at the time, um, there was uh, a new a piece of legislation that was introduced uh, by uh, members of Congress, uh, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Uh, it was actually uh, introduced by uh, New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith. 
Uh, and the now retired congressman from Virginia, uh, Frank Wolf, uh, both of them have been champions of human rights in China for a very long time, and uh, those names should be familiar with, uh, with, with some of you here. Uh, minority leader at the time, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, was also one of the original co-sponsors of the bill. Um, and, and, and so um, that, was, you know, that was sort of my starting point in terms of trying to uh, uh, advocate for, uh, for, for the rights of Hong Kong uh, in Washington. Uh, the very first member of Congress I met, I recall, uh, five years ago at the time was uh, Congressman Wolf. Um, and and uh, after the Umbrella Movement, I, uh, I, I was uh, met Nathan actually in the U.S. Uh, it, went, it was his first time coming to Washington. Uh, and then also in 2015, the same year, Joshua Wong also came to Washington for the first time. Uh, and we sort of took on this project to, to, to um, fight for our rights uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and trying to um, and try and use sort of the mechanism that the, the, the U.S. government has uh, to ensure that um, China is held accountable to those promises. Um, and and the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act was was the was the this most important um, piece of, 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 of that work. Um, and you know we've been through uh, up and downs uh, over the past five years. Uh, there were moments in Hong Kong, uh, you know, after 2016, especially uh, when we would you know sort of uh, consider it a, sort of a low point uh, in our civil society. Uh, when you know when we were the civil society in Hong Kong was really uh, affected by uh, deep divisions, uh, by uh, by a lot of infighting, um, and, and you know and, and there were you know events uh, that you know there were the kidnapping of the booksellers, uh, there, were, there were the uh, removal of the Financial Times editor, um, there were new infrastructure projects that facilitated Hong Kong China uh, sort of connections. Uh, you know, it, it was really not uh, a, a very good time for uh, the opposition in Hong Kong, and, and we were really worried that things were just going to go downhill. Um, and, and that sort of dynamics was reflected in Washington as well, um, when, you know, for three, four years, the piece of legislation, it was, it was always the same uh, uh, senators and the members of Congress uh, who championed um, uh, the, that uh, bill, um, but it never really gained traction. Um, it was a low moment, really. Um, but everything changed, uh, you know, in the past, uh, you know, since actually the, this spring, this past spring, uh, when the uh, sort of extradition bill controversy was uh, was uh, was building up, uh, and there was renewed um, renewed uh, attention on Hong Kong and Washington, um, and hence the, the fourth uh, the fourth time it was introduced, the bill was introduced uh, was actually June 13, um, so just four days after the one million uh, strong march uh, in Hong Kong against the extradition bill. Um, and the, the immediate day after the you know uh, uh, very big clashes outside the Hong Kong Legislative Council on July 12, um, that the bill was reintroduced uh, with much stronger uh, a much stronger lineup of co-sponsors. Uh, you know, in September 25th, on September 25th, actually on the same day, uh, it moved uh, past committee uh, in both the House and the Senate. Uh, very first time it has happened in five years. Um, and then on October 15th, uh, a little over a month ago, it passed uh, unanimously the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, and, uh, and I recall I was watching C-SPAN uh, live. I, I wasn't, I wasn't in, in, in the Congress in person, uh, but I was watching that. Uh, and, uh, and Nancy Pelosi, who was now the speaker, um, uh, she gave a very moving speech in terms of how much work that she's done uh, in the past number of decades uh, advocating human rights, not just in Hong Kong, but also in China more broadly. Uh, she was actually, some of you might know this, she was actually arrested in 1991 uh, protesting uh, at Tiananmen Square with two other mem uh, members of Congress, so she's really been, you know, with us for, for so long. And you know, and, and in, in Hong Kong, our sort of older generation of uh, of, of uh, democracy advocates, uh, Anson Chan and Martin Lee, uh, also have known uh, know her for for, for uh, many decades. Um, and um, and it's sort of for the past month or so, the, the bill was uh, stalled uh, in the Senate. Uh, and and we, and that was what, what we really were trying to do uh, in terms of getting that uh, through. Uh, and the uh, and there was finally a turning point last week, actually, uh, when the uh, when uh, Senator Rubio, who was the author of the bill, um, and uh, and Jim Rich, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman, uh, actually managed to convince the Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell to uh, hotline the, uh, the 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 bill in the Senate. Uh, and that was uh, put in place last Thursday. Uh, as of uh, today, uh, there was no holds uh, in the hotline, uh, and I believe uh, literally half an hour before this talk began, I was uh, reading on Twitter, Senator Rubio told the press 
that uh, he's expecting that the bill will be passed unanimously tomorrow. So, uh, so it's. Uh, <laughs> So you know that I mean, so so many people has, has put in hard work. Uh, you know, it, 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 just naming everybody who's you know who has done uh, work to push forward this piece of legislation will take uh, up uh, a, 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 whole, a whole hour in and of itself. So I won't go into all the people that I have to thank. But uh, you know, right now, then the next step sort of is that the House and the Senate would have to. Uh, form a, a, a small committee uh, to reconcile the uh, small differences between the two versions of the bill, uh, and uh, if both are passed unanimously, uh, it will be sent to the White House. Uh, I don't think the president will veto it, um, but even if he uh, is unwilling to sign it, uh, it will become law because uh, it's passed the two-thirds supermajority in both houses of uh, the Congress. So, um, so this is what's basically been happening uh, in Washington. Um, and I really do think that that uh, there are you know there there are there are many ways that uh, you know with this piece of legislation um, that the U.S. government can can hold the Chinese government accountable for those promises that it's made. Um, but you know, in the more symbolic sense, it really was uh, you know this sort of shift uh, is 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 uh, what we're seeing is a new bipartisan consensus that have emerged um, for decades now. Uh, some would argue as early as uh, 1972 when. President Richard Nixon visited China for the first time, that the uh, prevailing wisdom in Washington across the political aisle uh, is that engagement with China uh, would lead to uh, more freedom uh, in the mainland, uh, and that's because capitalism, uh, you know, economic freedom would eventually lead to political freedom. Um, you know, the, the, that was sort of the prevailing wisdom as well, uh, when uh, you know, even after the Tiananmen Massacre of 1989, um, you know, under Bush, the, the, they continued, uh, the U.S. continued to trade with, um, with China under President Clinton. Um, there were uh, MFN uh, status granted, uh, normalized uh, permanent uh, trade relations, welcomed uh, China into the WTO, um, and, uh, and that continued through um, even uh, the Obama period. Um, and and um, what we're seeing uh, right now with the presidency of uh, Donald Trump uh, is that there's increasing tensions between U.S. and China. Um, the way that he's pursuing uh, his goal is through a trade war. Um, and you may or may not agree uh, with that as being the best way to handle uh, the relationship between the two countries. But I think what we cannot deny is that um, you know, what he has done uh, has been to, to question uh, this prevailing wisdom. Um, and what we're seeing is a new bipartisan consensus that have emerged, uh, whereas the old piece of legislation, the U.S.-Hong Kong Policy Act, uh, in 1992, as I was talking about earlier, um, that was really about economic ties and cultural ties between Hong Kong and U.S. The idea was that even after 1997, um, that relations would, would continue. Uh, you know, both China and U.S. could benefit uh, economically uh, from the status of Hong Kong um, because both sides uh, had an understanding that the, uh, the, the autonomy of Hong Kong would be preserved. Um, and because then that has turned out to be not the case. Um, and, and by, by this point, uh, we are you know, well aware that, um, that there needs to be a uh, you know, new change in terms of policy. Um, and the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act in a symbolic sense really does that. Because it's saying that from now on, the US policy on Hong Kong is not going um, to be driven by trade. It's not going to be driven by cultural ties. It's going you know, to be driven by American values uh, and universal values, including freedom, including democracy, human rights. Um, and, and, and this is sort of the new direction um, that is going, uh, and uh, and and I would just uh, the last thing I would want to say um, before I, I hand over to Sharon is that um, we we're seeing that uh, you know this is bipartisan consensus. Republicans talk about this, Democrats talk about this. Um, you know the the Democratic primaries uh, right now uh, in the 2020, we see candidates uh, speak out for Hong Kong as well. Um, so it's really not a, an issue of left and right, uh, as I always always say, and as Joshua also always say, uh, but an issue about uh, right and wrong, and, and, and so um, there are many ways that uh, the Hong Kong issue is uh, playing out in the U.S. Uh, sort of presidential election, and also the Taiwanese presidential election as well. Hong Kong has emerged uh, as a very important issue. Um, so these are sort of the ways that Hong Kong fits into the global context, uh, and I can probably talk more about that later on in the Q&A, uh, but this is sort of the overview. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, to achieve bipartisan consensus is, is remarkable. Um, 
I'll just leave it there. Um, <laughs> yes. So now on to Sharon Hom. Sharon is an adjunct professor of law at, at NYU School of Law and visiting professor at Hong Kong University Law School. She's professor of law um, emeritus at CUNY School of Law, where she taught for 18 years, including training judges, lawyers, and law teachers in China. In addition to her academic activities, Sharon is the executive director of Human Rights in China and leads their human rights, media advocacy, and strategic policy engagement with NGOs, governments, and multi-stakeholder initiatives since 2003. Sharon is also an alum of the law school and was a Ruth Tilden scholar. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you, Siti. Um, thank you to the law school and to the Bernstein Institute and to the Bernstein family for this um, incredible support uh, for human rights in China and for the work um, that we're doing in China. Um, I also want to um, thank all of you because, as you can see, Hong Kong is very much in the media and very much of great concern to all of us. And so I think um, we really welcome um, the concern and the interest and the opportunity to talk about and to share thoughts about how we can move out of the current crisis. Um, I, I also, because uh, Bob Bernstein was a very dear friend and supporter, uh, I think Bob would have, as might have been already alluded to, would love this. Uh, for those of you who didn't have the chance to meet him, he was extraordinary, and he loved and he never shied away from a difficult um, issue or conflict as a matter of fact, he embraced it. As a matter of fact, he ran for it. So I think he would be very um, proud of us that we're attacking a very difficult, complex situation in Hong Kong and that we're thinking about how to do it together. So thank you. Um, I, uh, I want to speak as a, uh, both as a human rights lawyer and a practitioner. Um, and um, I'm also, uh, as Sipti said, an alum of the law school, but it was like several centuries before um, the folks on the platform with me. Uh, it was a long time ago. Um, but I, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, Human Rights in China, uh, the organization that I had, has been involved for more than three decades on supporting the development of human rights, rule of law, and uh, in, on the mainland in China. And we've worked with lawyers, Chinese lawyers, Chinese activists, democracy activists, and civil society groups for more than three decades, really to support them in opening up the space. And it's a very difficult um, journey that, that the, um, the mainland civil society is walking. We've been an active and present in Hong Kong since 1996, but we really felt that our focus and our mandate was on the mainland. As we can all see, the mainland and the future, the present, the past of Hong Kong and the mainland are intertwined. Our futures have to be a joint future, and that's why it's very important to have the, um, the discussions. Um, I think we all start, or I hope we all start, in the same position, that we all do not condone violence. I think we're all also in the same platform to say we need to figure out a way to de-escalate what is clearly an alarming escalation of violence in Hong Kong. It is a crisis, a political crisis, a social crisis, and a humanitarian crisis. I was teaching there until last week uh, when I came back, and being um, on the campus, I was able to see very powerfully um, the, the, the feeling and the atmosphere on the campus for the students and my students. Uh, I teach in the LLM intensive law program. My class, my intensive seminar um, was quite diverse. I had people in my class, um, mainland Chinese, uh, law enforcement, uh, a doctor, uh, a journalist. So while all this was happening, my class was happening as well uh, in the evening because all of my, stu my students uh, work during the day and they would come in the evening and um, mostly sometimes quite traumatized. But they did the reading, did the preparation, and we um, you know, had the discussion. I would say, did you do the reading? And I did the reading. So um, th that um, was 30 hours of a seminar in two weeks. What you're not reading about didn't get an uh, adequate coverage, because some of you uh, might have heard this expression for headlines in newspapers. If it bleeds, it leads, which means they want the sensational, because uh, 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 that's what grabs people. 
But some of the things that are happening on the ground um, are not headlines. So can you imagine a headline like this? A group of law students organize a community platform to try to explore constructive different strategies, and 150 show up from age teenage to over 70, and that they all talked for six hours and developed eight streams of work. Can you imagine a headline like that? You know, how many of you would read that? You go, no. Give us the like real, like, uh, like the, 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 the provocative stuff. So one of the things that was quite frustrating for me on the ground was that I really saw and worked with young people and um, old people like myself, you know, who were really trying to grapple with a very difficult, volatile, <laughs> fast um, developing situation on the ground. And so um, I want to use that as a way to jump into my first point, which is that it is a very complex situation. And even um, as we're writing or talking about it, it's developing right now. It's changing right now as we're trying to talk about it. And so my first point is, I think we should start having the conversation by first acknowledging that all of us have limited knowledge and understanding of what's going on. So let's start with trying to figure out what do we know? What do we not know? Why is that important? So that's, that's my, my first point. That's the challenge of being in a law school here, the challenge of evidence-based analysis. Let's try to have a conversation and the analysis based on evidence. Now here's the problem and here's the challenge. The challenge is that, as I said, first of all, for doing international advocacy work, is that I'm interviewed a lot by international media as well. And I'm so surprised by the way in which the conversation and the questions have so many assumptions, lots of assumptions, which I find, and I'm terrible in these interviews, because I should just go, well, I should just answer the question. But no, Sharon has to do things like, I don't know, I think that's not a good question. Or I say, is that the right question? And then I offend the reporter, you know, this is not a good strategy. And they will say, well, what is the right question? And then I'll try to say, well, I think the better question might be, instead of saying, you know, how do you get both sides to talk? I might say, I don't think there are two sides. And then they'll think I'm stupid. You know, I'll say, no, I don't think there are two sides. I think it's really much more complex. And by way of just saying one of the two sides, because of my commitment and decades of working with my Chinese um, colleagues and lawyers and former students on the mainland and activists, I really want to make this point about the sides. Here's a data point for everybody. Since June, up until last week, November 8th, 22 mainlanders have been criminally and administratively detained for what kind of things? Expressing support for the Hong Kong movement, criticizing the Chinese government's statements, posting pictures that they might have seen, because they got it through the VPN, of what is happening, and using music as backgrounds to some of the things they're doing, and okay, it was glory to Hong Kong. Who are these people? They were ordinary citizens, activists, a truck driver, a writer, a poet, a lawyer, a filmmaker, and, act and activists across the board. Where were they from? Beijing, Guangzhou, Liaoning, Hubei, Changsha, Hangzhou, Chengdu. In other words, these are mainland citizens in China trying to just simply exercise freedom of expression, which as we all know is, a, is in the home, uh, in the, Chinese state constitution that these rights, so they're expressing their rights and their views peacefully, and so they're serving five to 30 days in administrative detention. They've disappeared under residential surveillance at a designated location. And what are they charged with by posting these things? Picking quarrels, provoking trouble. Uh, some of them have served 37 days now in detention and subversion of state power. So my point is, let's not talk about everybody in monolithic groups. I don't think it's useful. I think it doesn't help us understand what's going on. Um, so the second thing I want to do is um, add some other data points just so we can think about what is going on. And I'm not suggesting, and those of you who know me know that I do not think statistics tell the story. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an economist, I'm not a statistician, but I do think we need some baselines here. So here are some baselines. 
So to date, at least 3,428 have been arrested and 449 charged. The common <coughs> charges are riots and assaulting the police. Um, some other perspectives on these numbers, um, of those arrested, almost 100 were sent to hospital. Um, some of them sent to hospital when they were arrested, and you've all seen some of the footage and everything. Um, they didn't appear to have any broken legs or any other broken um, part of injuries, but mysteriously, while in detention, they sent to hospital with broken uh, bones. Um, of the Yunlong, which most of you have probably seen, it was all over the internet, the Yunlong attack where they were clear, white-clad, triad-related, over 300 had metal, uh, what do you call them? The metal bars. Metal bars, but big bars, which is beating up everyone, anyone in the metro station. Okay, of that group, there were several hundred. 34 were arrested, and of those, six charged with rioting. We're following those. Of the 51 that was since sent, the 60 injured at Chinese University, um, about 60 injured, 51 in hospital, one of those injured was an infant, 10 months old. The other, I think, important is what happened, and Nathan referred to this, what's happening to the police. The traffic police officer who ran his motorcycle deliberately into the protest crowd and backed up and then wove in and out and tried to hit some more, um, right now has been suspended but not sanctioned or punished. The officers who filed grenades, and according to Hong Kong police internal guidelines, when you fire tear gas and sponge all the other, they're, not, they're called non-lethal, but they indeed they're lethal as you can see, they've blinded people, you're supposed to shoot below the knee. So when people are shot in the chest, in the eye, and in the head, that is clearly way above the knees. So none of that has been, uh, none of those actions have been disciplined. In terms of injuries and deaths, um, there have been reported at least nine suicides related <laughs> clearly to the protests. And they left suicide notes on the walls before they jumped or other um, situations. There are mysterious deaths. There's the 15-year-old competitive swimmer, and she was found dead in the water. She was a protest activist. Dead in the water ruled a suicide. Many of the students, including um, at my university, HKU, have a huge um, like shrine or memorial place. And people trying to erase her name, and they've written her name on all the walks at the university. And they say, her name was Christy Chan. Her name was Christy Chan. And they put pictures up. And um, following the death of uh, Zhao Silop, the um, student who um, was um, unclear, uh, the, the, the official reports are that he jumped and thought there was a ledge, but there wasn't a ledge. So he was in a coma, and then he died last Friday. So that was part of a lot of the, um, the, 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 the emotional anger and grief that you have to understand. There was an enormous amount of grief and anger. And I think one of the things I've been trying to put out as a message is all the students, all the protesters, everyone, the message I've been trying to say personally is let's first respect the dignity and the privacy of a family because they have suffered an incalculable loss and we need to support and respect their right to breathe. And so that's uh, one of the messages. Um, another um, death, a mysterious death, is a young protester dressed in black was found uh, with a head injury. Apparently they said he fell. Um, he later uh, is now in serious. Another one died also of an, of quote, an apparent fall. So what I just want to say about all of that is the point about all of that is we think we know what's going on. You think you know because we see so much footage, so much video, so many things online. But the reason why we really don't know what these deaths and what the causes and what the violence and what the police are doing, that's why it's so important to support one of the all five demands of the movement, of which the most important at this present moment is we demand an independent, investigation of the police 
allegations of abuse because those have also been um, um, uh, reviewed by independent UN experts who have also issued statements of concern. So I think I um, just want to end that by saying that on the narrative, let's have the conversation, let's recognize the complexity, and let's hopefully um, be able to make a contribution to moving past um, this crisis together. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, you left us with thinking about um, one way forward, which was the demand around the independent investigation. And before we turn it over to all of you for questions, um, quickly, Jeffrey or Anne, Nathan, is there anything you want to add in terms of what you think is a crucial next step or way forward in this crisis? Um, and then we can open up the floor to future questions. Well, um, I, I think, um, as Sharon just said, uh, one of the uh, demands of the uh, protesters, the setting up of an independent inquiry commission is crucial because uh, we've seen like overwhelming uh, consensus in the society, which the pool data shows that there are more than 80% of people supporting that demand. And we clearly see that according to the uh, statistic of like the arrested persons and the police in investigation, there's a huge um, controversy uh, that the police are acting in impunity. And that is the reason why the, the, the escalation of force is there because uh, when protesters think that the, the police, um, they could act without any consequences, they would like to impose deterrence effect on them in order to protect themselves from the assault of the police, so that there will be escalation of force in order to um, or kind of uh, counteract the impunity of the police. But if um, we, we send a signal to the society as a whole, or the government, saying that the police uh, who committed misconduct can be held accountable, and there will be um, relevant punishment on them, then the protesters will de-escalate de because of that. So I think um, if we're talking about trying to find a way out, trying to solve the problem, we act on what the root cause of the conflict is, and the police brutality is definitely one of them. And setting up an independent inquiry commission could also prove them, well, prove those police who have been uh, acting in accordance to the protocol well, a good name back to them. So I think um, it's definitely the next step of the society. I think that is the thing that we need to uh, de-escalate the, the, the situation. Yeah, and then um, very quickly, um, in terms of you know what's the next step, I think we are all committed to finding a peaceful resolution um, to the crisis. Um, but the really, I mean, the the, 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 the fact of the matter is, you know, since June, Hong Kongers have insisted on five demands. Uh, and those are the five demands that we still call for. Uh, one of them has been met so far, the full uh, you know, withdrawal of the extradition bill that started it all. Um, but you know, <coughs> no one's under the, uh, the uh, illusion that, you know, that, that that was it, because the movement has moved um, beyond that one bill or you know, the resignation of one person um, or anything. It, it's, it's really structural. Um, and, and, and certainly, I mean, the, we're talking about 80% over 80% of Hong Kongers, not the protesters, but Hong Kongers as a whole, um, supporting uh, one of the five demands, which is the independent investigation into police brutality. Um, and of the five demands, even the one that are sort of least uh, 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 favorable one, uh, the uh, full amnesty for the, uh, for the arrested protesters, even that one has support of something like 56 or 57%, according to the latest poll. So all five demands have over, you know, uh, have a majority of, of support from, from Hong Kongers, uh, and, you know, really, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, you know, because of the unequal power relations, really, it's not up to the protesters to decide, well, how are we going to end this? It, it really, it, it, you know, President Xi and the Hong Kong government uh, have to have the courage to, to say, well, you know, um, we've created this crisis, 
we have to deal with it. This is a political issue. Uh, a political issue uh, has to be resolved politically. Uh, it cannot be resolved physically, uh, as we've seen, uh, or legally. I mean, through you know, just prosecuting people. Um, it, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't get to the root cause of it. Uh, and then uh, one last thing. I mean, in terms of big picture, what's the what's the sort of next step? I think for 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 many years, um, the the sort of for observers uh, of China here in the U.S. Uh, and around the world, at least in the West, um, you know, to understand China, they, they try to understand sort of you know what's happening in Beijing, what's the decision making there, you know, what are the issues on the mainland. Um, but what we've what we've seen uh, in recent years is that to really understand China, especially uh, the Chinese, uh, you know, international ambitions, uh, you should not look at the core, but the periphery. Um, you, you know, we talk about um, you know up to one or two million uh, Uyghurs uh, that are uh, in, you know, in, in prison, in concentration camps, basically in, in Xinjiang. But we're talking about uh, you know intimidation uh, of Taiwan. Uh, you know, there's a big presidential election uh, coming up, uh, as I said earlier, uh, in January, in two months' time. Uh, and, and you know, you know, China repeatedly making threats, uh, military threats uh, as well. Uh, and then in Hong Kong, where where um, sort of the, we, you know we are uh, by most objective measures sort of the freest uh, place uh, on Chinese soil, uh, and and these and this is the place where uh, these ideas uh, uh, you know used to have a platform, uh, and and now you know that's sort of shrinking. Uh, and to look at you know to look at and, and Tibet as well uh, for for a much longer time to look at these peripheries uh, is a much better way to understand uh, chi Chinese ambitions, and I think that. This provides a new framework uh, for the U.S. Uh, to, to craft this policy and, 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 and the rest of the world uh, in, in terms of policy responses to, um, to China. Thank you so much, Sharon. Did you want to add anything, Sharon? Or I do think we, we should yeah, take well, time for the questions, so I'll, I'll just hold anything else I have to say for after or whenever. Wonderful. So we have about 50 minutes, actually, for questions. So uh, team members from the Bernstein Institute will be um, they're holding mics. We ask that you actually come to the mic. They will continue to hold the mic, but you just speak into it like in the talk shows. Um, you'll have one minute to ask a question. I'm going to take three questions at a time. Brian and Tyler, if you want to just start with these folks. Your first. And I just want to thank the audience really for um, the respect and, and, and how peaceful the discussions have been so far. Thank you so much. So uh, I just have questions for the two student leaders. So we're talking about seeking a democracy for Hong Kong, but um, we've seen many uh, violent cases happen and initiated by the protesters uh, recently just because someone disagrees with them. For example, there is an old man who was set up on fire by the protest just because uh, he argues with them about their agenda. So. And there are also many local shops were uh, burned down by the protesters just because they have some relationship with men in China. So would you uh, expressly condemn those violence against innocent people and uh, uh, raise out some specific, specific measures that you would adopt to curtain those uh, violence against innocent people? Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, as we all know that Hong Kong is a great city, and thousands of mainlanders live in Hong Kong, and I come from, uh, uh, I come from mainland too. Uh, but I was disappointed by the professor. You said you condemn no violence. Uh, but this is what was happening 80 years ago. This was what happened to Jewish people. This is a so-called the Crystal Night. Yeah, the, yeah uh, also called the night of broken glasses. This is what happened to Jewish people. And similarly, this is what happened to Chinese merchants, the merchants of mainland in Hong Kong. Did you condemn such violence? If mainlanders can no longer live in, can no longer peacefully live in Hong Kong because we feel like Jewish people, we feel like Jews. Uh, so I've got a question. Okay, you, you've um, already come to a minute, sir, so if you could okay, just be one very question, one question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we demand an independent inquiry into the violence toward mainland merchants. Thank you. Okay. 
So, um, coincidentally enough, I was going to write about this anyways, but I'm a Jewish American, and um, as such, we, I was raised with this fundamental value of human rights, because I think that we, as a people, understand that the international system was built to make sure that other people don't suffer the way that we did in the Holocaust, and it feels like human rights and international accountability structures that came up after World War II are falling apart, and not just in Hong Kong, and not just in Xinjiang, but also here in America, where we're putting children in cages on the borders and Trump is dismissing the UN, that was supposed to be the vehicle for reinforcing all of these values, and it doesn't feel like we're a shining beacon on the hill anymore for those things. So I was wondering how we can push our anti-human rights government to pressure China and other anti-human rights regimes as more than just a way to stick our thumbs in the eyes of people who we're currently having a trade war with, and more as a matter of principle. Uh, thank you, and thank you for talking. So I turn it over to the panelists to respond. I can quick summarize, or if you know which your questions are, I'll save time. Um. Well, uh, thanks for the question, and um, I think we will separately answer uh, some of them. Um, regarding to uh, well, the, the, the incidents on the innocent people, and I, of course, I think uh, well, particularly that incident of setting a, a, a like old man on fire that was definitely inappropriate, inappropriate well, um, unproportional, and that was definitely uh, one of the cases that I, I think the protesters they, they need to review that and to work on it and to grant their uh, moral high grounds in order to really convince the others that we are seeking an inclusive society, that we respect uh, all the different opinions, even though they are sometimes conflicting to each other. And I think that's exactly what uh, we are doing. Like, there is no perfect victim in the society. There, there are a lot of mistakes. There are a lot of wrongdoings that, like, both lives could happen. But that is what exactly um, a, protester, a protest could be, because these are the people who are constantly being suppressed Persecuted, they're facing like intimidation, <laughs> threats of being assaulted. You can see that there were protesters who were merely sticking like uh, stickers on the land on wall, being stacked, um, being sliced on their legs, and they well, someone could not walk again. So these are the threats that they're they are being imposed. And most importantly, we recognize that power differences that these protesters on the street they are very vulnerable. They are not being protected by the police because the police has been shouting them as cockroaches, they have been exerting excessive brutality on them. They are facing like a very uh, exposed environment in which gangsters and all the collu uh, colluded individuals with the, um, with the Chinese Communist Party or the uh, police could attack on them. And they are actually fighting the rights, not for themselves, but for the whole Hong Kong seven million population that their rights of voting and freedom of speech have been deprived. So I think sincerely that they should, well, be more tolerant to different opinion. And the way that we preserve Hong Kong values, uh, we have always been an inclusive and open society that like, people come here, learn our, our culture, and understand our values, and that's what um, the Chinese government has been lacking to do so, that they try to like, um, well, getting our system, merging into them, regardless of our, our unique, uh, or unique respect on our human rights and our freedom and our democracy. So I think um, it is important that we review, keep on going review, reviewing our protest movement, but on the other hand, we have to pay like, sympathy to them that these people, they're not like, people with the executive power, they're not people with guns, they're not people with, uh, well, a lot of resources that they, they could utilize to protect themselves. And um, with, with this occasion, well, with this occasion, I think, um, yes, indeed, it happens, and I don't think that is pro appropriate. But at the end of the day, we are, the, uh, well, a group of people were working on Hong Kong's democracy, and I, I think that it is very important that we remain united as long as the government still abusing all the institutional means to suppress these people. Well, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a student activist, and I'm not even young anymore, but if I could address that question, uh, sorry, but I felt like I'd, I would like to just add to that. Um, I think that when we, uh, you know, those incidents of violence, 
um, against people that might be perceived as mainlander, the journalist, or that, that old man that was set on fire. These are horrific acts. And I think those acts, so the question on the focus of condemning and not condemning, that's not the issue at all. For anyone who has such a horrific criminal act committed against them, there is a rule of law, more or less, still in Hong Kong. And what happens under that rule of law is that the police are supposed to arrest, which they have, and they're supposed to investigate, and the prosecutors then charge, and then they go through a system. But here's the problem, and this is a fact, that when anyone, not in that particular case, but in all of the other hundreds of cases, when an individual is arrested, the policemen, as a pattern, have been doing seven on one or 10 on one. That is 10 officers after they've cuffed, the internal guidelines on once you've cuffed, you're not supposed to be kicking them in the heads. You're not supposed to be beating them, 10 people, of the person who's cuffed on the ground. You're not supposed to be pulling people's clothes off. So there are some real issues about rule of law and compliance by the law enforcement officers with rule. Second, since we're in a law school, we all care about due process. That means when you're arrested and alleged to have done whatever, you're supposed to have right to counsel. So the lawyers have now reported as a pattern that they've been denied access to their clients. Um, so that is a problem. Then they don't have some of the evidence. So I think we should all be concerned about that set of, I would say, cases where it's an individual protester or whoever who commits a violent act or vandalism against property, the proper way to deal with that is within the criminal justice system, which has crimes, which has a process, and all I want to emphasize on that is people should be afforded the process and the, the all of the rights. <laughs> the other thing just I wanted to add when you were talking about context is, um, I think I have it right, was it the 70s, the corruption of the police in 1977? Yes, yeah. So in 1977, I just want to give you a little bit of context on this, that the, the Hong Kong police force was notorious for being the most corrupt police force in Asia. That's saying something. And everybody was on the take, so that new officers would be given a Hongba envelope and say, shut up and take it and don't cause trouble. And since they were paid so little to get 200 a week was another 800, which is half, almost more than you know, a, a substantial salary. So what happened was a commission was put together to investigate the corruption on the police. Do you know what happened? The police protested illegal assembly. Thousands on the street and said were being persecuted. Then they went and beat up the members of the independent commission investigating them. And then they also vandalized the offices of the commission. Well, what happened to move the process forward? All the police, charged, not charged, future to be charged, were given a full amnesty to move the process forward and to begin rebuilding the police force, which took decades to build it back to becoming really one of the <coughs> finest forces in Asia. And I have to tell you personally, when we were involved in 2001, 2003, when I was involved in other legal demonstrations, you know, we would be over on the sidewalk and the police would come and say, Siu Jian, Mo Yisi, they're very polite and say, get back on the sidewalk. And you know what we all said? Oh, Mo Yisi, yes, sir. And then we would move back to where they wanted us to move to. So it is profoundly distressing to me to have over you know, decades of being able to see the police be respectful to citizens, citizens being respectful to the police, that we are now in this um, um, situation. So I, I wanted to say that about the police. I wanted to say about the question, and I, um, I, I just want to do a gentle, respectful caveat, um, that we should be cautious about equating one set of difficult trauma with another. And I think to equate what is happening to mainlanders, including many of my friends, students, and colleagues in Hong Kong, with the mass genocide, systematic, conducted by a powerful, full war machine of Nazis who exterminated millions systematically, I think we should be, I just want to respectfully say, please, let's be careful about equating this. I'm not sure. <laughs> That I, what I 
think it's, it's just for us to be respectful of, of other experiences. Um, I want to say one sentence about international system falling apart. It's like democracy. It's like all of the things that are falling apart in this country. Democracy, human rights, and that system, it was never meant to be linear progress and liberal visions of how progress happens. It doesn't go like this and then we reach some nirvana of democracy and human rights protection. <laughs> what it is is it's a battle. It goes back, it goes forward, and when Chinese officials, and they do talk to me, tell me either publicly, look at the US, you're a Chinese national. I go, yes, I'm a Hong Konger, I'm a Chinese American, I'm proud of it. But I also say, yeah, and there are real human rights abuses here. Don't tell me, a Chinese American woman growing up as a minority in the US, about human rights abuses here. So I know exactly <laughs> what this country history has been. The racism, the violence, this is, don't tell me about this. So what I see it as is we need to be accountable and responsible in every community we belong to, wherever we are. And um, we're, we have a big battle going on here. We have a real struggle in this country. And we all have to be part of that. You know, Unfortunately, for those of us who live in multiple communities, I come back from Hong Kong, I see the impeachment starting, I go, oh my yeah, have impeachment here, I've got Hong Kong crisis. But that's the nature of what it means to be a member of different communities. So I, I want to say that it's a, it's a bad answer, but it means it's a struggle. And that's what it means. We will get the human rights and the democracy we are willing to struggle for and defend. No one's going to hand it to us. And then just to uh, respond to, to the questions, uh, and I said this just now, and I'll say it again. Uh, you know, we are all here committed to seeing a peaceful resolution uh, to the end of you know the crisis in Hong Kong. Uh, and the longer that the crisis continues, um, the more you know, uh, more of these episodes that we don't want to see uh, will 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 continue. And 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 I think then, uh, as I explained earlier, and as Nathan and Sharon have said also, that you know is it, you know. There is an end uh, to 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 that, but um, but really, it you know, it's not up to um, the protesters uh, as we you know we are fighting to defend our autonomy uh, and for democracy. Uh, it's really up to those uh, who who are in power. Um, you know, we can go on and on and on about these specific incidents uh, that that have been. You know, happening in Hong Kong, you, you know, there's always like 10 second clips, you know, you know, how do you come in on this incident, how do you come in on that incident. Um, what I want to say is that we should look at the big picture. Uh, and, and Sharon is absolutely right. I mean, it, the, 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 the thing is then that, of course, I mean, you know, setting a, a man on, on fire, definitely that's wrong. And I'll say this, that's wrong. Uh, and, and it's horrific. Um, but, but so what, what I support is then whoever uh, who committed um, that act of violence. Uh, and by the way, we don't know whether that's even a protest or not because there's so much well-documented instances of police infiltration into the crowds. Uh, but whoever committed that, 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 uh, that violent act, brutal violent act, should be held accountable according to the rule of law. But the, the structural problem is that, that we're not seeing that uh, accountability uh, when it comes to uh, crimes committed by uh, the police uh, and and also the authorities, I mean, no one has you know no one in the government has resigned. Uh, you know, after six months, uh, not a, a, a police uh, member of the police force is under investigation. Uh, and, and 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 on the other side, you know, you have mass arrests uh, and, and 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 unmistakable police brutality against protesters. Uh, and really, this is the sort of structural problem that we should get at. Uh, you know, I, as a student of history, you know, I know, uh, you know, I've studied, uh, you know, the Holocaust, and, and, and I know uh, that part of history well. I, I would agree with Sharon, uh, and, and I believe with so many of you here that, you know, that, that sort of comparison um, between, um, you know, what's happening in Hong Kong uh, and what, what's happening in China even is it inappropriate. Uh, and, 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 and I think then to have a constructive uh, dialogue, I think we should, you know, we should be uh, mindful of the um, pain that uh, sort of these uh, 
you know, metaphors can 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 inflict on others. Uh, and and but 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 I you know I, I think then uh, the person who asked that question uh, is uh, committed to uh, dialogue, and, and and so am I, uh, and that's why we're here. Uh, you know, I, I recognize the, the tremendous difficulty of this kind of dialogue in Hong Kong right now between protesters uh, and the mainland Chinese. Unmistakably, there, there's hostility between the two sides. Um, but the reason why I'm here and the reason why you are here uh, today at this venue is because we want to have the opportunity to do what we can do here that we cannot in, in Hong Kong. Uh, and, 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 and I think then, you know, by showing up and, and, and being here and answering a question, I'm doing the best uh, I can. Um, and then uh, I guess there's just the question, yes, the question about uh, U.S. Uh, policy and sort of human rights. Um, I, you know, it's, it's not a secret that I, I have my reservations about the current administration when it comes to human rights. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, uh, our work uh, as the Musisto and, and, and also our you know, Hong Kongers uh, trying to defend our autonomy, you know, we have really focused our advocacy work uh, in the Congress um, because we believe that legislation uh, is, 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 is the best way um, to, to, to advance our rights uh, and, and to build alliances uh, in Washington in terms of what's the best way uh, for us to move forward. Uh, and, you know, and I've gone in length to discuss you know, how you know, the, the bill that we are, you know, we, we've been uh, uh, you know, fighting, to, 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 uh, uh, fighting for, uh, you know, how, how that's coming uh, close to, 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 to being uh, a, a success. But that's not the only thing. I mean, Protect Hong Kong Act, a piece of legislation uh, that would bar um, U.S. companies from selling uh, you know, weapons like tear gas to the Hong Kong police force. Um, there's the uh, Hong Kong Be Water Act, uh, another piece of legislation uh, that would uh, impose Magnitsky sanctions against officials uh, in China and in Hong Kong um, that are uh, found responsible uh, for committing human rights abuses. Uh, you know, these are important efforts, uh, and, 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 and we want to focus on, on, uh, on, on, on you know, advocating our rights uh, in the Congress because it's easier to uh, find allies there, I believe. Um, but by no means uh, am I completely uh, you know, disappointed by all administrations. Uh, you know, I, you know, many of us follow the Democratic primaries very closely. Uh, a number of Democratic candidates uh, have been outspoken about human rights abuses in Hong Kong and in Xinjiang, especially with the, uh, with the New York Times that just published actually yesterday or the day before, um, troves of documents uh, that, that, that's, you know, that document uh, the concentration camps in Xinjiang uh, against uh, the Uyghurs. Many of Democratic primary uh, candidates have, have, have spoken out, uh, and, so, and, and also on Hong Kong. Uh, I'm thinking about, for instance, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, actually Julian Castro tweeted today in support of Hong Kong. Uh, there's uh, Booker, Senator Booker in New Jersey, and also uh, Kamala Harris in California. They have co-sponsored the Hong Kong Human Rights Democracy Act. I think then for uh, anyone who is uh, disappointed about the current administration, there are good candidates to look for uh, in, the, uh, in the upcoming election. Uh, and I think then that uh, there are many ways that uh, the U.S. Can, can restore its role uh, as a global leader uh, that are committed, uh, that is committed to defending the international system uh, and defending uh, you know, universal rights that we all believe in. I think we want to take another round of questions, and I would just ask the speakers, I know it's difficult, but to get, just to try to limit your answers a little bit more in the next round, just so <laughs> we can get more questions. <laughs> I'm looking at all three of you, I'm not pointing, I'm just pointing. Um, just because we do want to get a couple more rounds of questions in. So Brian and Tyler, yeah. Oh, hi, uh, Professor Sharon. You are keeping talk. You are keeping uh, talking about the evidence, and you talking about those uh, uh, those burned people or right, incidents. But uh, just to let let us to look at the at the evidence, and we have seen that so many uh, Hong Kong universities has sh shut down because of the violence caused by the protesters, and we have already know that some toxic chemicals have or, or has already been stolen from those universities and those uh, shops and companies who um, whose owners are from mainland China has already been destroy destroyed by those protesters. Do you still uh, think those are just incidents? And this is just one question. Another one is that, Jeffrey, you were talking about that the US government has a right to, uh, to give pressure to the Hong Kong uh, internal affairs and the EU has already uh, taught that uh, the, uh, Hong Kong is under the one country, uh, one country, two systems, uh, th this system, and you have already uh, know that 
Hong Kong is just a part of China and it's just an internal affair of uh, China. And so we have already know that according to the non-interference uh, pro principle of the interfere, uh, internal affairs, according to the international law, that only if one five requirements has already been satisfied and you can just ask, you know, uh, the, the interfere, uh, internal affairs can be uh, just in, interfered. Can you just uh, tell us one by one whether this requirements, five requirement has already been satisfied under these circumstances? And if not, why don't you just uh, let the U.S. government to, to violate uh, the, the, this international law? Okay, these two questions. Thank you. Okay, my question will be very quick. Uh, uh, there's an opinion in Hong Kong that's stating that uh, we can bring the police to say international court, international court or like international arbitration kind of things. Yeah, so I'm just like asking what, what do you guys think about the feasibility and the uh, viability of this kind of opinion? Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming to speak to us. Um, we can see, I mean, Sharon, you spoke about um, the many people in the mainland and from the mainland who have been supportive of uh, of the Hong Kong uh, people's rights uh, and, and um, protests going on. Of course, there's many other people in the, uh, in the mainland as well as from the mainland and elsewhere who are very much against. We only need to look outside. We can look at the Facebook page video of the, all the negative uh, <coughs> faces um, about this talk. Um, and I guess my question is, is the, for those involved in the planning and the strategy of how this, um, how the protests are going and how the movement is going. Um, I've talked to a lot of people uh, from the mainland and asked them about their concerns and, and questions like fairness have come up, questions like um, the idea that, uh, notions that Hong Kong is, is wanting to be different, wanting to be special, is not paying attention to the mainland and that it's all, all these different issues that have engendered a, a feeling of, of uh, of, of dislike for the movement, and I guess is the movement taking account of mainland uh, the mainland population's uh, perspective and trying to find ways to convince mainlanders that no, this is a positive movement that they should support it. Um, yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll answer this set of questions um, a little bit quick, more quickly, and then we'll come back to you all. Let me quickly, okay, while you're thinking. Um, the quick question on can you bring the Hong Kong police to an international criminal court? No, because China has not signed onto the Treaty of the International Criminal Court. So that's the short answer. You can't just haul people in, they have to have jurisdiction. Um, the second question on uh, interference, I think that's a, a more complex, important question. I think um, national sovereignty and state sovereignty is one of the principles when the founding of the UN uh, as together with the other fundamental values. Um, I think that you need to uh, be careful uh, because um, I think, frankly, the Chinese um, government issues a very strong, detailed, evidence-based report on the human rights situation in the US. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. It's annual. I commend it to you. Cites a lot of Amnesty Human Rights Watch sources. And they say a lot of things that I've just said, police violence here, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think the US has ever accused them of interfering in the human rights situation here. Maybe they should. But I'm saying that um, international human rights is an international standard. And every member of the UN has an obligation to address these questions and support civil society. So I think that if China raises it, I, I've always been concerned, and I go, yeah, but I think your human rights report on US is very good. You have to be careful. <laughs> so I think we need to be careful about um, uh, raising that, though I do understand that it is one of the major talking points uh, for the China story, which they raise at the UN, which they raise at the EU China, at the US China, and to the media, and via diplomatic circles, and that story, as you all know, is don't interfere with our sovereignty, you're hurting the feelings of the Chinese people, et cetera, et cetera, you all know that. Um, the, the fairness question and whether uh, mainlanders' voices should be, uh, the, the, if I understand the question, is, it is there are three levels of that question. First, let me answer it as HRIC. We believed, way before this happened, 
way before 2014 and the Umbrella Movement, we saw that it was going to be very important to have mainlanders speaking with Hong Kongers, young, because the old generation, we were saying, forget it, they won't change anything. <coughs> so let's look at the young people. So we actually convened 14 conversations between young mainlanders living, working, studying in Hong Kong, and young Hong Kongers. Go to our website, you can read some of it, and I can speak for Ni Ling Tsui, my colleague and I, who convened those over like 18 months. It was fantastic. It was difficult. There were mutual, bleh, like this at the beginning of the conversation, some hostility, some misunderstanding, but we were committed that that's the process. That's what needs to happen because there are only 7.4 million Hong Kong, Hong Kongers, but there are every day 200 and, uh, 150 mainlanders who are moving to Hong Kong as permanent residents, and over the course of a year, um, something like millions, and sometimes <coughs> in some years reaching eight million. So I think myself and my organization, we believe it is very, very important to have that kind of conversation, and we try to um, promote that. So I, I think that's important. Now, that's a separate question from the movement. The movement, we should stop calling them the movement because they're actually different voices and they're actually debating that. And I feel that when I raise this point, um, I do have conversations with people in different parts of the movement. And when you say, should they, should they, this and that, I think we should flip that frame. And it's not about a should. It's about that Hong Kong people have the right to try to figure out their concerns and their future. It's not about whether we can say, should you? They have that space and right. And as a human rights professional NGO, our job, just to be clear, is unlike, a, like we're not a political party, we don't have a platform, our job is to protect that space and to enable a civil kind of space for people to work that out. Okay, so uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, the question about uh, the uh, sort of uh, fighting between the uh, police force and the students at the university campuses, of course, that's very troubling. You know, last week it was the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Right now, still ongoing, that's Polytechnic University of Hong Kong. Um, yes, you, you know, the the, the, the uh, member of the audience who, who raised that question, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are toxic uh, chemicals being released as a result of these fights. Uh, the toxic chemicals uh, actually came from Chinese-produced tear gas uh, that are being used by police against protesters. So, uh, so of course, we are committed uh, to uh, a, a Hong Kong uh, that is less polluted. Uh, and, and, and as a result, of course, then I would uh, support uh, efforts to limit uh, the use of tear gas and other weapons by the police. Um, but uh, but the, the big question that I don't think anybody has, a, has an answer to is why are, you know, why are the police trying to you know, break into the university campus in the first place? And I don't think anybody has a, has, has a good uh, uh, answer to that. You know, there's just you know, university students there trying to defend their campuses uh, and the police could have retreated at any time uh, and they decide against doing that. Uh, and, and hence uh, the continuation of those clashes. Uh, and so to put an end to that, uh, I would suggest uh, that the police retreat and the, you know, the students could all go home. Uh, and then the other question very quickly uh, in terms of uh, non-interventionism, uh, I, I guess I have already made it clear what I meant uh, in my introductory remarks, but uh, to very quickly explain, uh, yes, uh, Hong Kong is currently a part of PRC under one country, two systems, um, but the treaty uh, that, that governed that uh, handover in 1997 is an international treaty registered at the UN. Hong Kong has always been an internationalized place, an international port, uh, and, uh, and China benefits tremendously from the fact that Hong Kong is internationalized. Uh, you know, up to two-thirds of uh, foreign direct investment in China uh, are still in one way or another processed through Hong Kong. Financial institutions in Hong Kong, for instance, Chinese companies, they're listed in the Hong Kong uh, Stock Exchange. Uh, these are just, you know, some of the many instances where, uh, you know, just to show how important Hong Kong is to China. Um, under U.S. law, you know, Hong Kong is treated as a separate customs territory, 
Uh, but that is contingent upon the fact that China honors the promise uh, of genuine autonomy in Hong Kong. So if China does not uh, honor those promises, uh, I don't think it's fair for China to be able to reap the economic benefits of Hong Kong. You know, China can't have it both ways. Uh, and, and, and the way for the United States to respond uh, as, a, as a legitimate stakeholder in Hong Kong because of the American presence there, business presence uh, in terms of tourism, in terms of students there, uh, expats living there. The American response to that is to reevaluate U.S. policy on Hong Kong. So actually, uh, the U.S. Hong Kong Policy Act is a piece of American legislation that passed the Congress and signed into law by an American president. The Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act is another piece of American legislation uh, that's being uh, uh, processed uh, right now through uh, the United States Congress. So when I hear uh, the Chinese uh, Foreign Ministry criticizing uh, this bill, uh, it sounds to me also then that's uh, an attempt uh, by the Chinese government to tell what U.S. political leaders should and should not do uh, in terms of how uh, the U.S. should, uh, you know, uh, legislate. So, 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 uh, if you, uh, you know, insist on non-interventionism, then I think you would be able to see that there's some contradiction there. Uh, and and just as Sharon say, uh, you know, human rights, I think, is a universal thing. Uh, I don't think that we should all say, well, you know, let's not intervene. Uh, and, and using sort of non-interventionism as a, as a sort of excuse uh, and a sort of blanket term uh, to ignore human rights abuses. Uh, and uh, so, so that's sort of my response to that. And uh, it, you know, it's, it, it increasingly it, it may, may be a, a not a very uh, not a very uh, popular thing to say. But I guess then you know, if you know, having concern over you know the rights of other people of self determination, just basic human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Uh, if that makes me a globalist, then you know, then let's be it. Um, well. Answering to the question of like dialogue with the main issue, then it reminds me of my personal experience um, in August when I was announcing that I am here in the US to pursue my food studies and the Chinese government launched a huge smear campaign on me in, uh, in their like, Weibo account and all sorts of things and accused me of like, uh, there was a famous slogan, you go jail, uh, we go yell, things like that. So <laughs> accusing me, well, <laughs> kind of like ripped them, but yeah, kind of like accusing me of like abusing the credentials of the movement in order to pursue my personal, like, um, 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 personal interest. But what they didn't know is, first of all, I went to jail. That's a quite an obvious uh, fact that you could Google it if you could. Uh, the, se <laughs> um, <laughs> the second is, well, that, 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 that's quite amazing that, um, because I actually got the offer in March and I posted online on my Facebook in March and the movement broke out in June. So they are saying that I received my offer in March with the credentials that uh, the movement in June and, um, well, it's definitely sound contradicting, but Still, the, the mainland media all reporting in the same tone without even questioning the rationale behind it. And they like, um, and there were massive mobilization of netizens, Chinese uh, coming to my Facebook where they climb up the wall um, occasionally to do things that um, well, they thought that um, like they're, they're legitimate to attack me. And um, that became a scene that I was so puzzled because um, I'll, I've always had uh, an intention to really have a dialogue with uh, people from different opinion, but seemingly the firewall in mainland China is just so strong and solid, and somehow a lot of uh, people living in the firewall, they kind of internalize uh, that mindset, and even though they have climbed out, they, they, they haven't been seeking opinion outside uh, the, the information or news sources that um, they could have allowed it inside the wall. So that, that was kind of like a, a puzzle for me. And for me, it, it's important that I could have a dialogue with them. And I remember when I was taking, uh, having a talk in Yale, and a student, Chinese student approached to me and he said that, well, um, I, I had um, hesitated uh, when I was like, thinking about whether to come because uh, that will put him in danger. So I was asking, look, what kind of danger? I'm not going to ask to you. And he said that, no, because like when some the Chinese students know that he's coming, then he will be reported, and that will put him in danger. Like families in, 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 in China or visa because of having direct contact with me. And I was so um, shocked 
but like not really what, what is kind of expected, that there have always been pervasive reporting on how the Chinese students in the US campus are being monitored and being reported. And this is exactly the things that I learned from direct contact with them. And like people with similar, similar minds with the Communist Party, they don't feel it because like the Communist Party tolerates speech that in favor of them. But when those people who wanted to learn about more liberal mind and having opinion that are completely different from the Communist Party, then they, they, their, their thoughts are like being restrained. And I'm just so irritated that we're learning in a free country that um, uphold freedom of speech and academic freedom. But there are actually students in the campus, just because of their origins and nationality, they cannot enjoy the same set of freedoms that we are. And it, they are all being like constantly monitored. And I found it it's just so absurd that actually the high institution sector in the US does not like really address the problem properly. And I think that is definitely the responsibility for us to do and to help those that cannot enjoy the same degree of freedom that we are. And I think um, it is important that we learn that Chinese students, or like no matter overseas or in mainland, they always have different opinions. It's just a matter of like proportion. And we need to understand that our movement is not about identity politics. And our movement is not about like drawing a line between you and us, us and others. But it is a movement between uh, well, people versus authoritarian regime, people fighting for their own freedom and their human rights and their dignity. And I cl clearly know that well, there are actually Chinese students in Hong Kong that are in the front line, and they, those are being silenced. Th those cannot be heard from Chinese. They are always like supporting our cause because they have experienced something that they could not have experienced back in mainland. So I think. Well, let's not draw that opposite in that dichotomous understanding between people. But I think for our duty, no matter if you're from Chinese, or from, from China, or from the US, like, I think like, for my responsibility and duty, I think is to get as much as support that we can get as long as we share the same set of values and we share the same worry about the authoritarian power that has been expanding and the worry of the reception of democracy. Likely be our last round of questions. So, oh, hi, um, hi. Thank you so much uh, for speaking. Um, so, I, I just this is a very strange question. I think. Um, so, I my my father is from mainland China. Um, my mother is from Hong Kong. I was born and raised in Hong Kong. Um, so, when Sharon we talk about Vietnam. I started to cry because I'm from you know. <laughs> and you know, you know what happened in the train station? It was terrible. I mean, you know, if, if you just walk in you know, and somehow you got bitten for no reason and then the cops don't do anything to help you. I mean that's terrible and 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 I'm from Hong Kong so I feel so much and you know it's my neighborhood. I grew up there. <laughs> And so, and so whenever I tell people I'm from Hong Kong, and you know, some a lot of people, you know, they're very good to me, and they ask me how I feel about <coughs> Hong Kong, and there are a lot of people who listen. But sometimes when, I mean, I don't want, I don't really mean to point fingers because I, 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 I have some, you know, really good mainland friends too. But sometimes I get really afraid when some mainland people. They see me, you know, because I, I go on to do land wars in the city. And sometimes they come, you know, they know I'm from Hong Kong, but then the first question was, oh, what do you think about the violence that Hong Kongers are doing to mainland people? I understand that. I mean, as I'm sure as the three panelists mentioned already, we all feel terrible when, I don't think anybody should get hurt, like if mainland people the store owners or the old men, they shouldn't be set on fire at all and they shouldn't get hurt. But I was, it, this is a real question, but it just, sometimes it gets so emotional and I don't know how to respond if someone, like, if, if it happens to, if this happens to, in mainland, if that, thank you, if, thank you.
think so. As if that happens in mainland, if if I see mainland in a city in mainland, my father is from um, Sunjan, and and if in Sunjan the police hits, you know, they don't help the citizens. I I would I, I mean the first thing I would probably ask them, oh, are you okay? You know, but I wouldn't ask them if. You know, why are you, you know, attacking people? I, I don't know, it's just, it's a really weird um, situation. It's like, can you please ask me how I feel? I think this is a little bit selfish, but can you please ask me how I feel first before you accuse, like, almost like my people of attack, attacking? Like, how, how can I respond, like, without, you know, feeling hurt? Um, you know, because I don't want to alienate people, and thank you so much. And I know that probably I, I heard you speak Mandarin, so you're from you know, mainland, so thank you so much even for this. So I, I don't want to, you know, especially if I'm living in New York, I want to have open dialogue with mainlanders. And sometimes I feel really worried. I don't know how to even engage with them without, you know, being too emotional. So I'm sorry, this is a strange question, I hope. You know, I convey it properly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I'd like to ask, um, what would happen to college students in China, or more particularly, college students at NYU's Shanghai campus, if they attempted to organize a panel like this? or a panel about Tiananmen Square, where the mention of those two words can get people arrested. Okay, I think let's take two more questions and then we'll, we'll uh, guess um, this first. So, so we already have the uh, US Hong Kong policy act in uh, 1992, and then uh, it seems like everyone is looking forward to the new law. Uh, but I'm not so convinced that the new law is going to make any change because, uh, for example, you don't have police, you don't have a court martial to bring China in front of court. You have no judge between countries. So how can uh, how 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 I should convince that uh, something is going to happen uh, uh, with the new law? Um, uh, so that's my question. Okay, one more question. Yeah. So, uh, so Professor Holmes, I have a question for you. Um, yeah, I think you, when you justify the protest, the protest, you call it what Chairman Mao, you know, just said uh, at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, uh, said like anyone who crushed a student movement will not have a good ending. Uh, I mean, Chairman Mao uh, didn't crush the Cultural Revolution, but China doesn't have a good ending. I would say uh, it becomes an insane fiesta of revolution, uh, of violence, uh, last for ten years, and it's it's a disaster. Uh, but now we have another leaderless student movement with a lot of violence. Uh, and the speak men, you know, and women says that they won't condemn any violence uh, on the protester side. So my question is, do you think uh, this protest will turn into another cultural revolution? Uh, like what measurements, you know, you would take uh, to, pro to prevent this movement from, you know, uh, becoming, you know, another cultural revolution? Okay, I, uh, I turn it over to you all. The guys are looking at me. <laughs> uh, um, I, I want to say something about the, um, uh, I, and I don't mean in any way to undermine anything, other perspectives, but I don't believe any initiative is a silver bullet. I don't believe the Hong Kong Policy Act is gonna end violence or do a radical shift. So I think any looking at any one intervention, whether it's US legislation, um, UN special experts issuing a statement saying they're very concerned and the police should be trained, you know, I think you need all of that. Um, I, I do want to say about Chairman Mao, um, I, I was uh, saying it a little bit tongue in cheek during the hearing, but I have to tell you that a Hong Kong taxi cab driver quoted Chairman Mao to me. Uh, when I was leaving Hong Kong this trip, because we got into a huge argument about the um, what's happening, and he was got so emotional, I thought he was going to crash us both into a wall, and he was just really like yelling and screaming at me, and, and because he was saying we have to do this, if we don't do it now, to what you got, you got, you got, you got, you know, it's going on and on. I go okay, and then he says, 
And what Mao said is a revolution is not a dinner party. I go, oh, whoa, no, no, no. So I thought that was really a, a, a very um, interesting, and I'll use that as a moment to comment on the question I didn't answer to, which was directed at me about incident. I don't think any of these um, examples and, and cases that we've raised are isolated incidents. I think they're part of a very concerning, complex, volatile, in movement situation on the ground. And I do think that, I, I don't think any of them can be picked out by himself. And my main point was that we really need to stay on top of it and we need to listen and read different sources. I tend to be a news junkie, that's why I don't sleep. I usually follow all different sources. I watch the live feeds, I follow Xinhua, I follow Global Times, because I want to know what different sources are saying. And I would urge all of us um, to also do that. Um, the, so there's no silver bullet. Um, the, I, I hope I wasn't heard as justifying anything in terms of a movement. Um, if you're referring to the CECC hearing, I only had one purpose there in September, and that was that I felt that the narrative of violence, which is perpetrated by the official story about what's happening in Hong Kong from Beijing, <coughs> that official narrative that it's violent and it's rioters, echoed by Xi Jinping, echoed by Carrie Lam, before the evidence, before the investigation, is putting a label of rioters, terrorists, independents. I'm trying to resist that and trying to say, and that's my only purpose, is that there is so much more happening on the ground. I can guarantee it. And lots of peaceful stuff that you're not reading about. And you need to ask this question, those of us who are now here, and not on the ground, you need to ask this question. Why are Hong Kong people, taxi cab drivers, I speak to my favorite Paul Paul who runs his little shop, like a street sh uh, <coughs> shop that I always go back and visit her, and you know, King Guy, and I bring her tea, and we just chat. I talk to the store owners, and I say, oh my god, am I holding home like this on here? Is it really influencing? because the tourists aren't here, my business is really bad. I go, oh, I think that's so bad. I'm telling you that this is not an anecdotal, but it's like I hear them saying, but this is what needs to happen. I'm losing business, but I know we need this to happen. So one of the things that I'm not justifying, I'm just telling you and sharing an insight that, that social workers, journalists, over a thousand doctors and medical workers trade unionists, why are they supporting the movement? And I want to suggest that it's because they have eyes. They see what is on the ground. And not only do they see it, ordinary citizens have been harassed banker coming off work, just police, rounding up 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds now, searching their backpack. So they're seeing this. So you need to understand that that 80% support for an independent investigation is not coming out of propaganda. It's coming out because Hong Kong people are seeing what's happening. And we didn't even talk about the legal actions being taken. Um, the masks has just been held to be unconstitutional, the anti-mask <coughs> ordinance. However, the legal actions also have to do with doxing. You can't dox the police because that's a violation of their privacy and the safety of their families. That's a court decision that's important. Don't dox the police and their families and disclose privacy, right? There's an important lawsuit on behalf of a young woman who was alleged gang raped by the police. And that lawsuit is going forward. There are lawsuits on behalf, so there's there's legal cases we didn't talk about that are wending its way through the Hong Kong courts. So I think that's also happening, but you know, I guess legal cases aren't like the most exciting headlines either, but they're also wending their way. So I wanted to point out, my last point is, there's a lot more happening and <coughs> continuing to happen, and I really, those of you who care and are concerned, you know, we need to follow. I, I want to say, out of, I want to say respectfully, because this is being recorded, to the university presidents, I happen to have my own view, and I think it was a mistake to evacuate all the mainland students overnight. In my own humble view as a nobody, you know, not running an institution, I think they sent the wrong message. 
They sent a message that there's a divisive. They sent a message that mainland students were not safe. Instead, I think, easy for me to say, Monday morning quarterbacking, but I think what should have happened was leadership, to have conversation, to try to address that feeling of insecurity and, 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 and fear, rather than to accentuate it and say, yeah, you are unsafe. So I'm very concerned about that kind of message, because no one should feel unsafe on a university campus. And, and to the young woman who um, shared from Yunlong, I think that is the critical starting place, that if we want to talk we really need to start by acknowledging the level of emotion of everybody, everybody, anger or feeling of distrust or grief or emotion. I think we need to respect and hear that. And I really do think that is the starting point. So thank you for sharing that. I think we need to begin by respecting where we are emotionally. And then I think we need to talk through how we can be supportive. So thank you for sharing that. I think uh, a lot of you may have shared the same experience as I for well, the past few days we day of night I watched 4 to 8 live together um, with my mobile phone my laptop and my iPad from different sources um, ranging from foreign uh, news agencies to Hong Kong local ones and we are all a sense of traumatized in this period of time, especially when we are watching things happening, not in Hong Kong, but in overseas, where seemingly we are so helpless about the situation. And I was just received a message from my friend, um, said he was locked up in PolyU last night. Uh, I got a message last night in US time, but by the time I was checking my message during the forum, um, my friend said he was already arrested and um, they have to face for like years of sentencing and that particular person I, I knew um, coincidentally and uh, he was uh, well, always playing um, football with me in um, secondary school and he was that kind of person who didn't know about anything happening in society <coughs> just for fun um, like just like a teen who doesn't care about politics and so on and so forth and well there are lots of people like that around me before the movement started but well s somehow I think all of you would have friends like that and ha you have no idea why they have come so far in this movement they have put their lives, um, their future at risk and um, fighting for things that you thought that they didn't care you thought that they have no idea what's happening about it but they just became that active and involved and you started to realize um, actually things changing in Hong Kong in a much faster pace than we expected. And uh, that you know that there are something very important happening. That these people who, are, who originally are very apolitical, but they become awakened and re um, willing to fight for that with their own lives and with their own future. And if you look at the pool data, it shows how desperate Hong Kong people are before the movement started. There's only, there, there were only 6% of people rating the police zero marks in a 10, 10 marks scale. But for now, the, 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 the people are rating that has already risen to more than 50%. And the, 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 rating of, uh, China, uh, the, the rating of the police dropped into historically low. And that's also the same thing happens on uh, like the rating of Harry Lam, the confidence of one country to a system, and the confidence of Hong Kong future. So you could see, like, in such an atmosphere, it is very hard not to be traumatized and not, put, not to be, um, like, sensationally depressed. But I think for us, um, it is very difficult, like, for me, I only have one, um, one, one, one belief that if Hong Kong now is really being demolished, there will be a one day that it can be rebuilt. And by the time that it will be rebuilt, we will be in a much better shape than now. And after we have all equipped myself and contribute ourselves and repay to the hometown that brews us. So I think that's the mo momentum and motivation that really will push every one of us to move forward even though in such a difficult times. And um, one thing I would like to mention about the bill is that I, I had a conversation with um, Bill Brother, who is um, the like, 
kind of like the creator of the Manisky Act. And he shared to me a story that um, after the proposal of the Manisky Act in the US, which it sanctions Russian uh, officials who have been, uh, who, who are responsible to the like, uh, homicide of the, uh, mas uh, the, 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 the Manisky and also um, like human rights violations in, in their home country, um, Putin had put uh, revoking that legislation as the first priority of their uh, foreign policy. And he had directly contacted uh, Trump's relatives before the general election to urge them to repeal that once, they, once Trump is elected. Of course, Trump didn't do it, but you could show that how terrified these officials are uh, regarding their assets to be frozen, to be confiscated, because um, these people, um, they, they only care about their own prosperity and their money, and most of them are stored in the overseas uh, <coughs> countries. And what, we, what I'm saying that is, um, it's not antidote to solve just all the problems in Hong Kong, but I think we could see it as uh, imposing a huge deterrence effect on the government officials that could block them from further um, well, committing uh, these human rights violations in Hong Kong without any consequences or without any worries. I think that's well part of the things that um, the bill could play in this complicated situation. Um, okay, so I yeah, so a few things to say. F first of all, I really want to um, you know applaud the uh, member of audience who just shared her experience uh, here in New York and, and also you know her background. It's not easy. Um, Yun Long is just one of the many instances you know we're seeing literally mysterious deaths. You know in in Hong Kong there are arbitrary arrests. There are credible allegations of sexual assault in, in, in police stations. Um, you know, many of the people who, who, you know, who are hurt and, and, and who are uh, arrested, you know, are, are my friends, are Nathan's friends. Uh, Sharon probably know um, a few people who have been, you know, who have been uh, under arrest and, and hurt in the movement. I think it's, it's, it's very painful um, to, to, to all of us. And, and I don't deny that, that, that it, this is also, the, you know, an emotional thing for um, the Chinese students and, and, and also, um, you know, citizens in China. Um, and, and I think that the best way to build a dialogue is to recognize that you know this is the case, and and, and, and you know and we you know we appreciate um, that. So so you know I don't have a perfect answer to that question except to to really thank you for sharing your experience. And I think that you know it, it, it is is a, is a small step toward building an understanding. Uh, and I'm and I'm glad that we are able to do that up here today. Um, you know in terms of the uh, question about the bill, I think you know Nathan has, really has touched on most of the points. Uh, you know, the, the, by, by holding Hong Kong and China officials accountable for human rights abuses in Hong Kong, um, it, you know, uh, through what the U.S. government can do, you know, by denying them access uh, to this country, freezing their assets, I think, I think, I think they're, they're powerful tools. I, I don't pretend that passing the bill, and that probably is going to happen uh, very shortly, I don't pretend that that's going to change everything in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, overnight, um, but it really does show that there is a symbolic change in terms of U.S. policy toward China. Um, there are, you know, periodic reviews in terms of Hong Kong special customs territory status. I think these are real tools that this administration and future administrations can employ uh, in response to, you know, changing circumstances in Hong Kong. You liars! And I think uh, you didn't answer the questions. Why do you attack innocent people? Okay, I just accept my freedom of speech. Okay. Thank so you, thank just, you. I That's you. I love, I love, I love, we, we do not, I'm sorry, this is you not, have you have already asked your question. I want to say, this is my freedom I'm sorry, of speech. you will need okay? to. I can go, I will go, but I want to finish my sentence. Okay, first of all, I think. I'm sorry, sorry. this is not your enough. portion this to have the conversation. This is the time for the speakers to respond to the question. You will need to ask your question. We will need to ask you to leave. This is, you've already had time for the questions and answers, and I was, I was just, I was just, a, I was just about to add, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that the conversation was thoughtful. Thank you. We had one hour of time, and I, I said.
the ground rules from the front end. We knew from the front end what the ground rules were, that we would take one minute of questions and then we would give time for responses. I want to thank all of you for being so respectful. The majority of the folks in this room really exercise leadership. So thank you for showing how constructive and then the rest of us will leave. So please remain seated. Another round of applause again for everyone in the room and for the speakers. Thank you so much.